Martin out and go to jail. I'm going to be happy. More video emerging tonight from inside the Capitol on the day of the insurrection. It shows a defiant and angry Nancy Pelosi. Now a response from President Trump. One day after the January 6th committee voted to subpoena the former president to testify for his role in that violent day. Will he comply? And what could happen if he doesn't? John Carl and Aaron Katursky standing by. A 15-year-old suspect is accused of carrying out a deadly mass shooting. Five killed, two more injured in Raleigh, North Carolina. Three women, a 16-year-old boy, an off-duty police officer among the dead. What we are learning about the suspects and the alleged 15-year-old killer. His death shocked the sports world. For the first time since Los Angeles Angels pitcher Tyler Skaggs' death, his widow and mother talk about his accidental drug overdose, his legacy, and what justice looks like for their family. I wonder sometimes if I'll ever be as happy as I, I was. I have a lot of healing to do, you know. I, I have faith that I'll, I'll get there. I know I'm never going to be the same. It's going to be different, but I believe that I can find happiness again. A scare in the air for a United flight right after takeoff. The bird strike that happened as the plane left Chicago for Miami. And the passenger reports that the engine was on fire. Legendary actress Gina Davis has made a long-lasting impact on Hollywood, and it's left an impact on her, too. Our candid conversation inspired by her new memoir. But if I could pretend to be somebody else, I wouldn't have to be self-conscious, because I'd be somebody. I, this is, you know, me, uh, hindsight. And cruising on to the country scene with a focus on honest and heartfelt songwriting tonight, my sit-down interview with newly AMA and CMT-nominated star Jordan Davis in our next Prime Playlist. I always thought that my fan wanted to hear a Take It From Me or a Sing With You Up. But when I'm like, no, they don't. They want to hear great, honest songs. And good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Another mass shooting, another act of senseless violence, another unknown motive, another day in America. Today, it's Raleigh, North Carolina, feeling the aftershock of a night of terror as a gunman, just 15 years old, shattered a quiet neighborhood, allegedly killing two people before fleeing into a nature preserve where several more people were shot. All told, five people left dead. After an hour's long standoff, as residents were told to shelter in place, officers taking him into custody with life-threatening injuries, we're told. As another American community grapples with a mass shooting, we are learning more about some of the innocent lives lost. But there is still so much unknown about what happened here and why. ABC's Elwin Lopez starts us off tonight from Raleigh. Tonight, the deadly crime scene stretching for more than two miles after police say a 15-year-old opened fire, leaving this East Raleigh community in disbelief. My heart is heavy because we don't have answers as to why this tragedy occurred. Authorities say the teenage suspect, now in police custody, began his shooting spree in this residential area on Thursday evening. Frantic 911 calls pouring in. A white kid ran out here with a shotgun. He shot somebody. The shootings occurred um, in the streets, in the neighborhood, and then the suspect fled towards the Greenway. That Greenway, a popular walking trail, police urging residents to stay indoors as they raced to capture the alleged gunman. Really scared. It's scary. We've been here for like 25 years and it's, it's too much. Tonight, a law enforcement official telling ABC News the suspected shooter is related to one of those killed. Of the seven people shot, five are dead including Tracy Howard's wife, 52-year-old Nicole Connors. She was just a kind person. She was a good person. She didn't deserve anything like this. Also killed 49-year-old Susan Carnatz, a mother of three. 34-year-old Mary Marshall, a Navy vet, just days from getting married, seen in photos with her nieces, Charlotte and Avery, and at her bridal brunch with her mother and sister. And 29-year-old off-duty police officer Gabrielle Torres, gunned down on his way to work. The youngest victim, 16-year-old James Thompson, a high school junior. All of us in Raleigh need to come together. We need to support those in our community who have suffered a terrible loss. And Elwin Lopez joins us now. Elwin, there are so many unanswered questions in this case, including why this teen allegedly went on a rampage. When do you think we'll be learning more details? 
Yeah, Phil, the motive is still unclear. It could take five days, according to the police chief, for us to get a full report on this. But I will tell you that the suspect here is in custody with life-threatening injuries. It's unclear whether those were self-inflicted or not. And I spoke to the DA just moments ago. She says that assuming he recovers, they do intend on trying him as an adult. Phil. All right, Elwin Lopez, thank you. We turn next to former President Trump's response to the subpoena from the January 6th committee and whether he'll testify under oath. It comes as we see more of that behind the scenes video with leaders of Congress on January 6th, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's conversation with former Vice President Mike Pence. Here's ABC's Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. Former President Donald Trump today reacted to the January 6th committee's vote to subpoena him with an angry 14-page statement. But he didn't say whether he would comply and testify under oath. Instead, he boasted about the size of the crowd that he had urged to march to the Capitol on January 6th. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Tonight, we are seeing how Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi reacted when she heard about Trump's plans. Secret Service said they have dissuaded him from coming to Capitol Hill. They told him they don't have the resources to protect him here. So at the moment, he is not coming, but that could change. I would come to him and punch him out. This is my mom. I would pay to see that. I'm waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out, and I'm going to go to jail, and I'm going to be happy. The footage was shot by filmmaker Alexandra Pelosi, the speaker's daughter, for an HBO documentary. She was with her mother as she fled the Capitol. Are you yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We have got to get the finished the proceedings. Later, she can be heard checking in with Vice President Mike Pence, political adversaries now sharing a genuine concern for each other's safety. Hi, Mr. Vice President. Hi. Yeah, we're okay. We're here with Mr. Schumer, Mr. McConnell, the leadership, House and Senate. And uh, how are you? Oh, my goodness. Where are you? God bless you. But are you in a very safe... Well, that we're still not safe enough for us to go back. We're being told it could take days to clear the Capitol and that we should be moving everyone here to get the job done. She ended the conversation with this warning. Okay, and then pause back. Okay, I worry about you being in that capital room. Uh-huh. Don't let anybody know where you are. Later, the vice president calls back to inform the speaker and Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer that they would soon be able to resume the certification of the presidential election. And I'm at the Capitol building. I'm literally standing with... Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Good news. Pence assures Pelosi there are thousands of law enforcement officers there to protect the Capitol. Her response, see you in an hour. Those dramatic behind the scenes moments. John Carl joins us from Washington now. John, the former president released that 14 page statement, but we still don't have a sense of whether he'll comply with the subpoena, right? It was a long statement. Lots of complaints about the committees, uh, lots, lots, uh, lots of uh, untruthful allegations about the election, but absolutely no answer, not even a hint of an answer uh, as to whether or not he will comply with the subpoena and testify under oath or whether he will defy it. Phil? All right, John Carl, thank you. Thank you. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins me now to help us sort of sort through all these legal challenges against former President Trump. Aaron, there are a lot of cases obviously underway. You're keeping a close eye on all of them. How do they stack up? There, there are a lot of them, lot. And, and the legal pressure really is only intensifying. We have, as the January 6th hearing was, was going on, the Supreme Court rejected former President Trump's request to intervene in it, his dispute with the Justice Department over classified documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. And then just today, the, the Justice Department asked a federal appeals court to shut down the special master review of all those materials. And, and separately, 
Uh, of course, he's being investigated over January 6th. And as that hearing was going on, Mark Short, then Vice President Pence's chief of staff, was going before a grand jury. And here in New York, uh, the attorney general is after him. He's got a trial with his company starting a criminal trial. So it really is coming at him from, from all fronts. Yeah, and that particular day was not a good one for the president's legal team, the Supreme Court, and what was happening in the January 6th committee, the subpoena they have issued. Um, I think the first thing that the president did was respond by saying, well, why didn't you do this? If you wanted me to talk, why didn't you do it a long time ago? A valid question. They said they wanted to get their information ready before they did. But I mean, the odds, I mean, we're so close to the midterms. If the Republicans take over, this sort of investigation kind of goes away. So the odds of him sitting before that committee, public or private? I'd say are very, very <laughs> small. Right. But you can tell that at the very least he's thinking about it. Because in his letter to the committee, uh, he didn't say no. Right. He, he went through a number of, of factual questions that, uh, 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 about the, the committee's work and about the election, a number of falsehoods, but he never said outright, I'm not coming. And, and he, he almost, uh, you, you might think, as we know, have come to know former President Trump, that he wants to do mm. it and, and wants to, to, to confront that committee. But there are far too many legal questions for him uh, that could expose him to potential uh, jeopardy for, for his lawyers to allow him to do it. He will, though, have to respond because we right. know that federal prosecutors have not taken kindly to failing to respond to a congressional subpoena. Just ask Steve Bannon, Steve who's Bannon. been convicted and is awaiting sentencing for lying to Congress. Or, right. Uh, contempt of Congress. Contempt of Congress. And you have you've you covered President Trump as I, as I have for years. One thing you know is just when you think he might not do something, uh, he will do it. And certainly he likes the attention on him and he would probably like a platform uh, to say what he wants to say but you're right there'd be like a team of lawyers <laughs> physically holding him back i think the exposure is is far too yeah. great because remember anything that he would say to the committee doesn't just live in the committee it could be used by federal prosecutors investigating DOJ, yeah. january 6th it could be used by uh, the attorney general of new york who has filed a civil lawsuit uh, against him or by the manhattan district attorney's office who has a, a criminal case against his company and and so just as he did when he uh, sat for a deposition before the, the attorney general's office in New York. He took the Fifth Amendment for, for everything. Right. And, and I would expect that if it comes to that, that's what would happen here. Aaron Katursky, thank you so much. Thanks, Phil. Next to the midair scare on a flight from Chicago to Miami, a bird strike just after takeoff forced the plane to turn around. What did the passengers hear and see out of their windows? ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the details. The United flight had just taken off from Chicago, bound for Miami, when the airline says the jet experienced a bird strike. This image showing flames shooting from the engine shared by airdrop among passengers. Something just didn't feel right about the takeoff. You think the worst possible scenario that you're going to, you're not going to survive it. We do see smoke uh, and fire coming out of left. Roger. The pilot declaring an emergency, turning the Boeing 737 around back to O'Hare. No one on board the flight was injured, and those passengers were put on another plane to Miami. This is not a heart-stopping emergency, but it is an emergency. Anytime we have something going wrong with an engine, and a bird flying through it uh, is certainly in that category. Bird strikes are very common, about 16,000 a year, but they rarely cause any serious accidents. And even though bird strikes may cause flames, the engine may be totally fine, but still pilots can't take any chances. Phil. All right, Gio, thank you. We turn now to Ukraine and the mounting pressure on Vladimir Putin. Russia is evacuating now the city of Kherson as Ukrainian forces advance their counteroffensive. And just weeks after mobilizing new recruits, the first of them have been lost on the battlefield. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is in Ukraine with more. Even as Russian missiles were raining down on Zaporizhia today, Vladimir Putin declared there was, quote, no need for massive new strikes on Ukraine. But after days of missile and drone attacks, Western sources tell ABC News Russia is rapidly exhausting its arsenal of long-range weapons. And in a sign of how badly the war's going in some areas, Russia now offering to evacuate citizens from occupied Kherson, one of the territories Putin recently annexed, but now under siege by Ukrainian troops who've reclaimed scores of villages in a major counteroffensive. 
Slow Ukraine! Losing her son would be a huge blow to Putin's war ambitions. With mounting criticism, the Russian leader announced his recent call-up of troops would be over in two weeks and that 16,000 reservists are already on the front lines. But military leaders are facing public criticism at home as the first deaths of these new recruits are reported in Russia. Where it's retreating, Russia is being accused of deliberately destroying everything in its path. Many towns in liberated areas now look like this. One week ago in the woods near Barova in eastern Ukraine, we were there as war crimes investigators unearthed a torture pit. Now the stories of what horrors were committed is becoming clearer. Sergei Alexandrovich was taken to the pit by Russian troops, according to his father. Alexander weeps as he recounts recovering Sergei's body, washing and burying him. Now watching as war crimes teams exhume his son's body to record what happened. But Alexander knows what they'll discover. He says his son was beaten and stabbed and shot multiple times. He left three kids behind. And Ian Panel joins us tonight from Kharkiv. Ian, a, a critical tool Ukraine uses to, to fight the Russians is the Starlink Internet service provided by SpaceX, Elon Musk's company. Uh, they've helped keep that country online, but now Musk is raising questions about the, the hefty costs of keeping them online. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the Pentagon is saying that it's received a letter from SpaceX asking that the Pentagon now pick up the tab for this Spacelink satellite service, which, as you say, has been so beneficial for Ukraine's troops. Large parts of the country have no communications other than the Starlink service. Musk, who appeared to intervene in a potential peace deal to the annoyance of Zelensky and other Ukrainians, apparently taking offence at personal comments by a Ukrainian official, but saying officially, well, the system's now become too expensive. Phil. All right, Ian Panel from Kharkiv, Ukraine tonight. Ian, thank you. Storms and heavy rain clearing out of the Northeast as a cold front moves in. And we saw the first snow of the season in Wausau, Wisconsin, up to three inches of snow in parts of the upper Midwest. That bitter cold is now coming down from Canada, reaching the Northeast by early next week. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, time this one out for us. Well, Phil, uh, there's a series of cold fronts that are coming through. One came through the northeast, and there's m more cold fronts backed up, and they're kind of being nudged down from Canada from this heat that's uh, been in the Pacific Northwest and will continue there for the next couple days. All right, here's a pattern that we're going to be stuck in, upper low over Lake Superior. That brings multiple rounds of cold air in, first one for the uh, Midwest and uh, Western Great Lakes. It will be tomorrow morning. So freeze warnings are posted just north of Chicago till, uh, through, through Milwaukee. Some frost advisories as well. So protect your plants tonight and uh, have your winter coat ready in the morning because it's going to feel like 28 degrees in central Illinois. And then uh, looking ahead for the next three days, you can see that some of that cold air gets into the, to the northeast on Tuesday and into the mid-south, potentially being below freezing in places like Nashville. We might see some record cold there uh, by midweek. And then here's this heat that they've been enduring really all fall long. A lot of these cities are on track including Sacramento for their warmest fall on record record high of 84 and 80 degrees respectively in Portland and Seattle tomorrow uh, really 80 degrees is unheard of in Seattle if they hit 80 on Sunday that's the latest 80 degree mark they will have on record so uh, unusual stuff for the Pacific Northwest uh, they'll get their turn I'm sure in the next few weeks but right now it feels like summer Phil all right Rob thank you U.S. stocks slumped today, uh, capping off a wild week of swings fueled by inflation concerns and fears of a looming recession. In the U.K., those worries have actually prompted a reversal of course by the new British prime minister. She had proposed sweeping tax cuts, but those sent markets tumbling. And now she's under fire after just weeks on the job. ABC's James Longman with more from the U U.K. Just six weeks after she became British Prime Minister, meeting the late Queen Elizabeth after replacing Boris Johnson and enacting sweeping tax cuts that sent the markets tumbling, tonight Liz Truss is fighting for her political survival. We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. Truss firing her finance minister and reversing her government's flagship tax-cutting budget. That caused the pound to crash against the dollar and did nothing to tame soaring inflation. Prices in the UK have risen 20% faster than in the US. I have acted decisively today because my priority is ensuring our country's economic stability. And as she ended that 10-minute news conference, the pound's sinking once again, reporters asking Truss if she'd apologise. Are you going to say sorry? And James Longman joins us now, right outside 10 Downing Street. James, that news conference from the Prime Minister seemed to do little to stop the turmoil in the UK markets. 
No, Phil. I mean, just as she spoke, in fact, just moments after she left that stage, the pound started to plummet again. Borrowing costs for the British government started to rise. Uh, and she's had to U-turn on her flagship policy. It's left a lot of people in this country wondering, well, what is Liz Truss for? She's fired her chancellor, her finance minister, in order to save her own skin. But she fired him for doing the thing that she wanted him to do. So uh, it looks like to most Britons and to most people in her party, certainly, that she is now a lame duck prime minister. We're now watching and waiting to see whether or not she can save herself. But just like Boris Johnson, it may be that very soon she gets kicked out of that door behind me. Mm. Phil. All right, James Longman, thank you. Back here at home, consumers, as you know, continue to feel the pinch. Airfares on the rise as so many of us return to the sky. So what does this mean for holiday travel and are there still ways to save? ABC's Trevor Alt with the details. The ticket prices were very insane. Monica Sue is trying to nail down her holiday travel, but like many Americans, she's finding flight prices are sky high. I usually spend both Thanksgiving and Christmas with my family, and this year I'm definitely going to have to choose one. Travel company Hopper says the average round trip in the U.S. this Thanksgiving will set you back $350, up 22% from 2019. And for Christmas, $463, up 25% from 2019. With these prices, even with thousands of cancellations and staffing problems over the summer, multiple airlines are seeing record revenue. Delta reporting a $695 million profit just last quarter, its highest ever. And American and United also say they're seeing no dip in demand. When lots of people want to fly, prices go up. But despite that success, not only are prices expected to keep climbing, several airlines, including Delta and American, are raising the requirements for frequent flyers trying to earn status. Now a lot of travelers are looking for better ways to score deals. Some considering subscription services from low-cost carriers like Frontier or Alaska. Spirit Savers Club will give you the lowest fares and discounted bags and seats for $69.95 a year. But whether that's a good deal for for you will depend on where you live and how often you fly. If you have a big family of four, five, six people, you're going to get $40 off airfare for everyone in your traveling party. It is a really good deal. But experts say holiday fares could climb 10 to $15 a day toward the end of October. So how do you save? If you can fly earlier in the week before Thanksgiving and return during the week after Thanksgiving, you can save 150 to even $300 off of airfare just by avoiding those peak travel days. All right, Trevor Alt, some good advice. Thank you for that. When we come back, protesters vandalize a masterpiece and wait till you see what they did next. Putting an end to politeness with Oscar winner Gina, Gina Davis. What she says in her new book about actor Bill Murray and the actress who inspired her to find her voice. But first, Tyler Skaggs' career was on the rise and he just celebrated his wedding when he died after taking fentanyl-laced oxycodone. His family is now speaking out for the first time on his life and their plans to keep his legacy alive. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome back. Take a look at this. This is an assault on a revered work of art. Two climate change protesters threw what appears to be tomato soup at Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers painting at the National Gallery in London. After vandalizing the masterpiece, they glued their hands to the wall. The museum says the painting is protected by glass and was not damaged. It was cleaned and put back on display a few hours later. The demonstrators were both arrested. Now to our interview with the mother and the widow of Tyler Skaggs, the MLB star who died in a tragic drug accident back in 2019. A former LA Angels employee was sentenced this week to 22 years for giving Skaggs counterfeit pills. His family is now speaking out for the first time. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the story. I loved him so much. We had a love that was so special. Carly Skaggs and Debbie Hetman, the widow and mother of Los Angeles Angels pitcher Tyler Skaggs, telling their story on camera for the first time since he died after taking fentanyl-laced oxycodone while on the road with his team in 2019. Yeah, I couldn't believe it was true. I, I mean, that day still haunts me. Medic 41, truck 41, respond, medically emergency, Hilton, South Lake, Town Square. Skaggs was just 27 years old when he was found unresponsive in his hotel room in Texas. How did you guys find out what happened to Tyler? Carly called me uh, and told me, and I, I was, wow, I was, I could not believe it. I was driving in my car, and uh, I got a call from the general manager. I knew it was bad. I didn't want to hear what he was going to tell me. I knew my life changed forever in that moment. Skaggs was in the prime of his life. He and Carly had just gotten married in December. Tyler Skaggs taking the mound for the Angels. He was on a mission to start 30 games that season. His family said despite injuries, he was well on his way. But then he took that laced pill. An autopsy report revealing Tyler died after choking on his vomit with a dangerous combination of fentanyl, oxycodone and alcohol in his system. At the point that you found out that there were pills involved, were you surprised? Yeah, that was the last thought that crossed my mind. I agree with her. I agree. We. Uh, it didn't even cross my mind, actually. You didn't have any idea that he was taking pain pills? Not a clue. On Tuesday, Eric Kay, the former communications director for the Angels, was sentenced to 22 years in federal prison for providing Tyler with the drugs that led to his death. His sentence, two more years than the minimum. The judge saying it was because of these prison phone calls. Hope people realize what a piece of he is. Well, he's dead, so him. Prosecutors also accused Kay of being in the room when Tyler choked, but not trying to save him. 
Do you wish that he would have done something? That haunts me all the time. It th to think that somebody is in the room and doesn't render help to your, to your child, to your son, and of course, it's so I, heartbreaking. You know, I always think about if why didn't I go to Texas? I wish I was there to save him, but he shouldn't have needed it. What would you say to Eric Kay if you had a chance to speak to him? Through this entire three years, he's deflected. He's not taking responsibility. And the fact that he speaks what he spoke about myself, my family, my son, it's, it's unacceptable. Kay apologizing for those comments in court. His attorney says he plans to appeal. During Kay's trial, five other major league players testified that he provided them with opioids. There's a chance that they could have gotten a lace pill and could have also lost their life. So it's, it's, it's pretty hurtful. The Skaggs family has filed suit against Kay and the Angels, claiming the team knew or should have known Kay was a drug user. In a statement to ABC News, the Angels called Tyler's death a tragedy, adding the Angels strongly dispute the claims made by the family in their lawsuit and will defend the organization in court. Fentanyl is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Last year, more than 71,000 overdose deaths were linked with synthetic opioids like fentanyl. We're fortunate because we can hold somebody accountable for our son's death, and, um, and a lot of people aren't able to do that right now um, with this fentanyl crisis. I miss Tyler so much. He was my, he was my only son, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be a grandma. I'm not going to be able to hold a grandchild, and those things are, are painful. I think about that all the time. I distinctly remember four days before he passed away, we, we talked about it, and... Um, he said, when I get back from Texas. <laughs> so, but, We're going to plan a baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he would have made an amazing father. He was so great with kids. And I wonder sometimes if he'll ever be as happy as I, I was. I have a lot of healing to do, you know. I, I have faith that I'll, I'll get there. I know I'm never going to be the same. And, and, it's going to be different, but I believe that I can find happiness again. Carly and Debbie are now determined to carry on Tyler's mission with the Tyler Skaggs Foundation, starting a baseball club and giving grants to kids who can't afford to play sports. You're doing a lot of good things in his name. Yeah. Those are things that Tyler, if he was still here, would probably want to do. Any opportunity I get to speak about Tyler and the incredible person that he was, um, that's what I'm going to do because he deserves it. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that. Still ahead here on Prime tonight, horrifying details on the arrest of a teacher the people she allegedly included on a kill list. Another formula recall why Abbott is now urging customers not to use one of its products. A dire warning about what we throw away. We take a look at the items poisoning our soil by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. The St. Louis Cardinals paying tribute to a baseball legend and Hall of Famer, Bruce Sutter, who left us today. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl. 
and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Ready for election night. I'm ready for debate night. I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi, everyone. We're going to run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're going to make you proud. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. Groups that track electronic waste are issuing a dire warning. The precious metals that make our smartphones smart, our LED light bulbs bright, and power cords charge are poisoning our soil, and the mines they come from could begin to dry up. The solution, they say, lies in recycling. So here are the details by the numbers. 5.3 billion mobile phones will be thrown away this year. Stacked up, that is 31,000 miles of phones reaching one eighth of the way to the moon. 27 million tons of small electronic equipment like electric toothbrushes, toasters, cameras will be tossed this year, but only about 17% of it will be recycled, according to the International Electric Waste Recycling Experts. Based on current trends, the group predicts more than 81 million tons of electric waste from tablet computers to washing machines will be thrown away by 2030. And at issue, many of the chemicals and metals that make our gadgets work are highly toxic. It's estimated that 55 tons of mercury have already seeped from electronics dumped into landfills into the soil and groundwater. Increased demand and volatile supply chains are causing price surges. Just this year, a 500% increase in the cost of lithium, which is crucial for our batteries. Hiding in our discarded e-waste, $57 billion worth of gold, silver, platinum, and other precious metals. That's more than the gross domestic product of most countries. Advocates suggest asking to recycle your old electronics when you purchase new ones. Most vendors will accept them, and they urge people to stop stockpiling old or broken small appliances. They say fix them or recycle them. We still have a lot to get to here on Prime, remembering actor Robbie Coltrane, who entertained a generation of Harry Potter fans with his larger-than-life character. And since he hit the country music scene, he's churned out hit after hit. We sit down with Jordan Davis to talk about his rise to success, where he finds inspiration in tonight's Prime Playlist. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. 
feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Five innocent lives taken in an instant in the latest mass shooting to rock America. We're sad. We're angry, and we want to know the answers to all the questions. Among the dead, 49-year-old Susan Karnatz, a 16-year-old boy who was a junior at a local high school, and Gabriel Torres, a 29-year-old off-duty police officer on his way to work, was also fatally shot. We have an officer down. We have an officer down. Police say a 15-year-old opened fire just after 5 p.m. Thursday in Raleigh. And ABC News can now report that the suspected shooter is related to one victim who was killed. Two others, including another officer, were also injured but survived. The violence first began on the streets, then moved to a popular walking trail. The gunman engaging in a long standoff with police. Authorities say before being taken into custody with serious injuries, it's unclear how he was hurt. Authorities still working to determine a motive, an initial report expected in five days. I'm really like scared and worried. Disturbing and violent comments allegedly made by a fifth grade teacher at St. Stanislaus School in East Chicago have left a deep concern lingering over Portia Jones, her family, and her classmates. That teacher now in police custody after comments allegedly made about Portia and other students. She said that she wanted to like choke us and like she wanted to like kill herself. Just before one yesterday, Portia Seth, she immediately alerted her counselor, then her principal. And police say while speaking with the principal, the teacher admitted to making comments about having a kill list, even naming a specific student's name, but never giving them the list. The teacher was sent home and told not to return to the school pending an investigation. A Texas judge ruling that young undocumented people can remain in the DACA program for now, but extends a current injunction that bars new entrants into the so-called Dreamers program. Abbott Labs recalling some of its two-ounce ready-to-feed liquid baby formula over a cap problem. It says the tops may not have been completely sealed. This could cause the formula to spoil, causing stomach issues. Abbott says most of the bottles were sent to hospitals and doctor's offices. You can check the lot number on the SimilacRecall.com website. Abbott says the recall won't cause supply issues, but in February, an Abbott plant shut down, leading to that formula shortage. You're a wizard, Harry. The actor best known for playing the gentle half-giant Hagrid in the Harry Potter films has died. Robbie Coltrane's agent says he passed away today at a hospital in his native Scotland. No cause of death was provided. Coltrane's other credits include James Bond films, Golden Eye, and The World Is Not Enough. He first came to fame playing a forensic psychologist in the detective TV series Cracker. Robbie Coltrane was 72 years old. A second line parade in New Orleans Saturday will honor Fats Domino, one of the Crescent City's most famous rock and roll musicians. A street where he spent most of his life will be renamed Antoine Fats Domino Avenue. Domino sold more than 110 million records with hits including Blueberry Hill and Ain't That a Shame. Domino died October 24th, 2017 of natural causes at the age of 89. 
You've seen her in classics like Thelma and Louise, Beetlejuice, and A League of Their Own, but there's a lot more to her than the roles she plays. Actress Gina Davis taking a revealing and humorous look back at her life and her new memoir called Dying of Politeness. She joins us now to talk about it. And Gina, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I, I've been through a lot of this, and it's opened my eyes. Um, you know, I know you as an actress, but it's opened my eyes to you uh, as a human being. So uh, thanks for writing. I think a lot of people are going to uh, appreciate the candor. Um, Thank you very much. You write through much of this, and you, you call it dying of politeness, that much of the early years, uh, there was a lot of politeness in your life. So where did that come from? Start there. Uh, well, my parents were like that. They were incredibly polite. They were both from small towns in New England. I think it's a, a, a partly a New England thing, but um, being self-sufficient and not having any needs and not uh, and, and you know self-effacing uh, even more than polite, it was um, don't be a bother to anybody. Mm. Don't, don't require anything from anyone. And uh, and so my whole family that was that was the biggest goal. That was my goal in life or that I was taught and then became my actual goal. I'm certain that you could dish on a whole bunch of stuff in this industry, right? Uh, but I have to ask you about this one, one particular thing that, that's getting some attention from the book. You write about alleged sort of abusive behavior on the part of, of Bill Murray, your co-star in the 1989 film Quick Change. Um, you say he, he used, this, this is just a weird, you say he used a massager on you during a private meeting or tried to and got to for a little bit and another time berated you in front of the cast and crew, yet you never said anything about it at the time. You, you said those were ways to test you. Well, uh, you know, I only learned later what it was about. It was at the audition that um, before he would let me uh, audition or talk about the role or anything, uh, I had to let him um, put this massager on. I had to lay down on a bed in the mm -hmm. hotel suite and let him put this massager on my back. And he was so insistent about it uh, that I knew I was never going to be able to leave the room unless I went crazy, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, without uh, you know being forced to do this thing. And I found out later that it was because he. Um, I had just won an Oscar, and he thought, "I'm not, I'm not going to cast her unless I know she's not going to think she's all that, and uh, mm. she has to, I have to be sure that she's going to do what I want." And um, wow. so that was one test. And then when I got the role, um, the first day of shooting, he uh, he went crazy and screamed at me in, in front of hundreds of people, um, and. Uh, uh, and that, and that was also, I saw him do that subsequently to other people. And I realized that's his way of intimidating people and making them, you know, afraid of him. And then they won't challenge him, I guess, is the idea. So you also write that Thelma and Louise changed your life, most, mostly through watching co-star Susan Sarandon. You write of being in awe of her the first time that you both met with Ridley Scott to go over the script. How did her confidence influence you? It, it was astounding. I mean, from the first time I met her, uh, and we were having a, the two of us were meeting with Ridley for the first time and going to talk about the script and everything, and and I saw that that's how she she was uh, handling this conversation with him. She wasn't apologizing for having thoughts and ideas, and uh, I was st and and I mean, the whole movie, the whole experience was. Uh, watching her, not only the way she moved through the world, but how people reacted to it, which was they didn't react. Before we go, I, I would just like to touch upon that. Gina, Gina Davis Institute uh, on, for Gender and Media to Achieve Gender Balance and Raise Awareness in the Entertainment Industry. That's your institute. It's been 18 years, right? 18 right. years. What are you most yeah. proud of having achieved um, for women and girls in that time? Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with the progress we made. I had this idea from the beginning that, uh, because I wanted to change what kids see first, um, and, and found that kids, TV and movies made specifically for them were wildly gender imbalanced. And I thought, well, we shouldn't be doing this. We're training kids to have unconscious gender bias. So um, I had this idea that data would make a difference. And it turned out, that it really works. And um, we have now just recently 
found that uh, now the lead characters in both TV made for kids and family rated films have achieved parity in the lead characters. So I think 18 years is, uh, is a pretty short time for such a dramatic change to happen. And Gina Davis, how lovely to speak with you. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Big fan of you, your work, the conversation. The memoir, Dying of Politeness, is available now wherever books are sold. By the way, we should mention we have reached out to Bill Murray's representative for comment. Now to tonight's Prime playlist. He cruised onto the country scene and since has churned out hit after hit after hit. But for Jordan Davis, it's really about honest, heartfelt songwriting, like in his hit record by Dirt, which was nominated for an American Music Award this week. I sit down with Davis, who has a knack for finding inspiration everywhere. Just seconds before taking the stage, Jordan Davis pumping up his band, and then the crowd. <laughs> this packed country music festival in Salt Lake City, more proof the 34-year-old hasn't just arrived, but is here to stay. In 2017, his breakout hit, Singles You Up, went straight to number one. High energy shows. An occasional shot of tequila. And you have country gold. Take it from me if you want a t-shirt to sleep in. It's my favorite, but you can keep it. In 2018, Take It For Me also soared to number one. Then... Slow dance in a parking lot, another chart topper. Two years, three huge hits. Whirlwind. I mean, really just an absolute whirlwind, personally, professionally. A songwriting machine already on a meteoric rise when he penned by dirt. I remember saying, like, this could be a good Luke Bryan pitch. You know, if I don't record it, you know, we should try to get it to Luke. The two met at a charity golf tournament, repped by the same label, not exactly texting buddies, so his next move was a gutsy one. You turned into a bogey. So I typed that text probably 20 different times. You would have thought I was texting like a girl that I've been crushing on for like three years and like asking her out for the first time. And I remember just being like, hey man, I wrote this song. You know, I'd love to have you be a part of it. I know you're busy, so don't even feel the need to respond. And I remember thinking like, Dude, what did I just do? And I looked down, and it's like, message back from Luke Bryan. And his response was like, I love this. From there, into the studio. The pair, recording by Dirt. But you can buy Dirt. You can buy Dirt. A platinum record released in 2021, right to number one earning Jordan nominations for Song and Single of the Year at the Country Music Awards. I think that did a couple things for me. It, A, allowed me to be a lot more honest in my writing. I always thought that my fan wanted to hear a Take It From Me or a Singles You Up. For where I'm like, no, they don't. They want to hear great, honest songs. You know a song is huge when thousands sing it for you night after night. I say it before I play it every night. That song is the three most important things in my life. Growing up in Louisiana, a football player surrounded by music. There's no getting away from country music in my household. My dad wrote songs. My uncle moved to Nashville to write songs in the 80s. Uh, my mom played piano in the church and just played piano around the house. Like, there was just always music going. Give me the names of some influences outside of country for you. Oh, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, John Prine, um, 
like Usher was, man, high school Usher was like, he was my guy, man. My See, that's why I ask, because... Confessions, dude, that record is still, like, the stuff that I, I listen to a lot. You know, Usher, Leonard Skinner, Almond Brothers, Black Crows. Getting ready for that festival in Salt Lake City, showing us his Gibson Hummingbird. My hey, Dirt was written on this, this guitar. Um, hey, I love the sunburst color, like I've always wanted, like a sunburst. With that guitar, Jordan writes at times with his brother Jacob and others in Nashville. If he ever singles you up, if he From singles you up to what my world spins around about his wife Kristen, and their daughter Eloise, and son Lachlan. I don't really know what it is, but now that I found it. Lyrics are key, but Jordan says so is song structure and a good hook. Hey, you change the you change the meter up, you change the melody, which is kind of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Like it just kind of gets you. That's it's just a different new thing to it. And I can't imagine me living without this. Yeah. That kind of bounce just makes me like right, that, that keeps kind of you pulls in me into it. Jordan continues to put out songs that resonate, like Next Thing You Know. Next thing you know, you're saving money like never before. I'm so bad at knowing that a song is gonna is gonna be a hit or you know it's, it's gonna connect I think which I think is good I'm trying to like stay in that kind of mindset writing because you know then it, it does just become an honest lyric and honesty is something Jordan strives for every time he begins to write. His latest album, a continuation of that. You know, I have a song here that covers my parents' divorce, a, a song about being a dad, uh, you know, a song about, you know, how sometimes I'm not the easiest guy to get along with, and my wife's an angel for hanging in there with me on those times. The love this country star has for his family and for music is as clear as the night he played in Salt Lake City, making his lyric from By Dirt, do what you love but call it work, into more of a mantra for this 34-year-old who is always writing his next song. Sitting at a bar the other day and somebody said, you know, sometimes I don't know if I'm living longer or just waiting to die. And immediately I'm like, all right, that's going in the cell phone. Like, Absolutely. it's going to be a super sad song, but, uh, you know, like there's something in there. But you can buy and you can bet there are more honest hit songs ahead for Jordan Davis. We thank him for his time. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, and it is 1600 year old history. Take a look at this virtually intact Roman era mosaic that was discovered in central Syria. It allegedly shows mythical scenes from the Trojan and Amazon Wars. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we are staying on top of a few things. New fallout over the January 6th committee's decision to subpoena Donald Trump. What was in a 14-page memo response from the former president. Plus, a closer look at what the latest inflation increase really means for our finances. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is abc news live america's number one streaming news free to you 24 7. watch america's number one news whenever you want it wherever you are anytime abc news live streaming live and free on all platforms ready for election night i'm ready for debate night i'm ready for it all this midterms is really important Everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? You're working on it, George. We're gonna make you proud. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Two major U.S. supermarkets will combine forces after a unanimous all-cash merger agreement was reached between the boards of Kroger and Albertsons. Kroger, the second largest grocery store chain, purchased the fourth largest Albertsons for an estimated total enterprise value of $24.6 billion. The company said they plan to continue with their shared track record of low prices, enhanced customer experience, and increased associate wages and benefits. The CDC warning the flu is here. Early increases in flu activity have been reported in most of the U.S., and they noted it's the A strain, which always potentially causes more severe illness. Flu season typically starts in the south then spreads north. Potterheads are in mourning today after actor Robbie Coltrane, known for playing Hagrid in the Harry Potter films, has died at the age of 72. He is survived by his sister and his children. Now to the latest on the mass shooting in Raleigh, North Carolina. Police say five people were shot dead near a nature trail last night. The suspect, who is just 15 years old, is in critical condition at the hospital as investigators try to pin down a motive here. ABC's Elwin Lopez has details. Tonight, the deadly crime scene stretching for more than two miles after police say a 15-year-old opened fire, leaving this East Raleigh community in disbelief. My heart is heavy because we don't have answers as to why this tragedy occurred. Authorities say the teenage suspect, now in police custody, began his shooting spree in this residential area on Thursday evening. Frantic 911 calls pouring in. White kid running out here with a shotgun, he shot somebody. The shootings occurred um, in the streets, in the neighborhood, and then the suspect fled towards the Greenway. That Greenway, a popular walking trail, police urging residents to stay indoors as they raced to capture the alleged gunman. Really scared. It's scary. We've been here for like 25 years and it's, it's too much. Tonight, a law enforcement official telling ABC News the suspected shooter is related to one of those killed. Of the seven people shot, five are dead including Tracy Howard's wife, 52-year-old Nicole Connors. She was just a kind person. She was a good person. She didn't deserve anything like this. Also killed 49-year-old Susan Carnatz, a mother of three. 34-year-old Mary Marshall, a Navy vet, just days from getting married, seen in photos with her nieces, Charlotte and Avery, and at her bridal brunch with her mother and sister. And 29-year-old off-duty police officer Gabriel Torres, gunned down on his way to work. The youngest victim, 16-year-old James Thompson, a high school junior. All of us in Raleigh need to come together. We need to support those in our community who have suffered a terrible loss. Our thanks to Elwin Lopez in Raleigh. We turn now to former President Trump's response to the subpoena from the January 6th committee and whether he'll testify under oath. It comes as we see more of that behind the scenes video with leaders of Congress on January 6th, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's conversation with former Vice President Mike Pence. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. Former President Donald Trump today reacted to the January 6th committee's vote to subpoena him with an angry 14-page statement. But he didn't say whether he would comply and testify under oath. Instead, he boasted about the size of the crowd that he had urged to march to the Capitol on January 6th. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down... We're going to walk down to the Capitol. 
Tonight, we are seeing how Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi reacted when she heard about Trump's plans. Secret Service said they have dissuaded him from coming to Capitol Hill. They told him they don't have the resources to protect him here. So at the moment, he is not coming, but that could change. change. Oh, he comes, I'm going to punch him out. This oh, is my mom. I would pay to see I'm that. waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out, and I'm going to go to jail, and I'm going to be happy. The footage was shot by filmmaker Alexandra Pelosi, the speaker's daughter, for an HBO documentary. She was with her mother as she fled the Capitol. Are you called Nash and Potter? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma we have got to get finished the proceedings or else it would have all become convicted. Later, she can be heard checking in with Vice President Mike Pence. Political adversaries now sharing a genuine concern for each other's safety. Hi, uh, Mr. Vice President. Hi. Yeah, we're okay. We're here with Mr. Schumer, Mr. McConnell, the leadership, House and Senate. And uh, how are you? Oh, my goodness. Where are you? God bless you. But are you in a very safe... Very special. Well, that we're still not safe enough for us to go back. We're being told it could take days to clear the Capitol and that we should be moving be everyone here to get the job done. She ended the conversation with this warning. Okay, and that calls back. Okay, I worry about you being in that capital room. Uh -huh. Don't let anybody know where you are. Later, the vice president calls back to inform the speaker and Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer that they would soon be able to resume the certification of the presidential election. And I'm, I'm at the Capitol building. I'm literally standing with... Pence assures Pelosi there are thousands of law enforcement officers there to protect the Capitol. Her response, see you in an hour. Those dramatic behind the scenes moments. John Carl joins us from Washington now. John, the former president released that 14 page statement, but we still don't have a sense of whether he'll comply with the subpoena, right? It was a long statement. Lots of complaints about the committees, uh, lots, lots, lots of uh, untruthful allegations about the election, but absolutely no answer, not even a hint of an answer uh, as to whether or not he will comply with the subpoena and testify under oath or whether he will defy it. Phil? All right, John Carl, thank you. Thank you. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins me now to help us sort of sort through all these legal challenges against former President Trump. Aaron, there are a lot of cases obviously underway. You're keeping a close eye on all of them. How do they stack up? There, there are a lot of them, and, and the legal pressure really is only intensifying. We have, as the January 6th hearing was, was going on, the Supreme Court rejected former President Trump's request to intervene in it, his dispute with the Justice Department over classified documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. And then just today, the, the Justice Department asked a federal appeals court to shut down the special master review of all those materials. And, and separately, uh, of course, he's being investigated over January 6th. And as that hearing was going on, Mark Short, then Vice President Pence's chief of staff, was going before a grand jury. And here in New York, uh, the attorney general is after him. He's got a trial with his company starting a criminal trial. So it really is coming at him from, from all fronts. Yeah, and that particular day was not a good one for the president's legal team, the Supreme Court, and what was happening in the January 6th committee, the subpoena they have issued. Um, I think the first thing that the president did was respond by saying, well, why didn't you do this? If you wanted me to talk, why didn't you do it a long time ago? A valid question. They said they wanted to get their information ready before they did. But I mean, the odds, I mean, we're so close to the midterms. If the Republicans take over, this sort of investigation kind of goes away. So the odds of him sitting before that committee, public or private? I'd say are very, very <laughs> small. Right. But you can tell that at the very least he's thinking about it. Because in his letter to the committee, uh, he didn't say no. Right. He, he went through a number of, of factual questions that, uh, 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 about the, the committee's work and about the election, a number of falsehoods. But he never said outright, I'm not coming. And, and he, he almost... Uh, 
you, you might think, as we know, have come to know former President Trump, that he wants to do mm. and, and wants to, to, to confront that committee. But there are far too many legal questions for him uh, that could expose him to potential uh, jeopardy for, for his lawyers to allow him to do it. He will, though, have to respond because we right. know that federal prosecutors have not taken kindly to failing to respond to a congressional subpoena. Just ask Steve Bannon, Steve who's Bannon. been convicted and is awaiting sentencing for lying to Congress. Or, right. Uh, contempt of Congress. Contempt of Congress. And you have you've you covered President Trump as I, as I have for years. One thing you know is just when you think he might not do something, uh, he will do it. And certainly he likes the attention on him, and he would probably like a platform uh, to say what he wants to say, but you're right, there'd be like a team of lawyers <laughs> physically holding him back. I think the exposure is, is far too yeah. great, because remember, anything that he would say to the committee doesn't just live in the committee. It could be used by federal prosecutors investigating DOJ, yeah. January 6th. It could be used by uh, the Attorney General of New York, who has filed a civil lawsuit uh, against him, or by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, who has a, a criminal case against his company. And, and so just as he did when he uh, sat for a deposition before the, the Attorney General's Office in New York, he took the Fifth right. Amendment for, for everything. Right. And, and I would expect that if it comes to that, that's what would happen here. Aaron Katursky, thank you so much. Thanks, Phil. Now to Ukraine and the mounting pressure on Vladimir Putin. Russia is evacuating the city of Kherson as Ukrainian forces advance their counteroffensive. And just weeks after mobilizing new recruits, the first of them have been lost on the battlefield. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel in Kharkiv. Even as Russian missiles were raining down on Zaporizhia today, Vladimir Putin declared there was, quote, no need for massive new strikes on Ukraine. But after days of missile and drone attacks, Western sources tell ABC News Russia is rapidly exhausting its arsenal of long-range weapons. And in a sign of how badly the war's going in some areas, Russia now offering to evacuate citizens from occupied Kherson, one of the territories Putin recently annexed, but now under siege by Ukrainian troops who've reclaimed scores of villages in a major counteroffensive. Losing Kherson would be a huge blow to Putin's war ambitions. With mounting criticism, the Russian leader announced his recent call-up of troops would be over in two weeks and that 16,000 reservists are already on the front lines. But military leaders are facing public criticism at home as the first deaths of these new recruits are reported in Russia. Where it's retreating, Russia is being accused of deliberately destroying everything in its path. Many towns in liberated areas now look like this. One week ago in the woods near Barova in eastern Ukraine, we were there as war crimes investigators unearthed a torture pit. Now the stories of what horrors were committed is becoming clearer. Sergei Oleksandrovich was taken to the pit by Russian troops, according to his father. Oleksandr weeps as he recounts recovering Sergei's body, washing and burying him. Now watching as war crimes teams exhume his son's body to record what happened. But Alexander knows what they'll discover. He says his son was beaten and stabbed and shot multiple times. He left three kids behind. David, that's your headline tonight. The that's Pentagon said... Ian Panel for us from uh, Harrison tonight. Or Kharkiv, rather. A U.S. stock slumped today, capping off a wild week of swings fueled by inflation concerns and fears, of, of course, of this looming recession. In the U.K., though, those worries have prompted a reversal of course by the new British prime minister. She had proposed sweeping tax cuts, but those sent markets tumbling. And now she's under fire after just weeks on the job. ABC's James Longman from the U.K. Just six weeks after she became British Prime Minister, meeting the late Queen Elizabeth after replacing Boris Johnson and enacting sweeping tax cuts that sent the markets tumbling, tonight Liz Truss is fighting for her political survival. We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. Truss firing her finance minister and reversing her government's flagship tax-cutting budget. That caused the pound to crash against the dollar and did nothing to tame soaring inflation. Prices in the UK have risen 20% faster than in the US. I have acted decisively today because my priority is ensuring our country's economic stability. And as she ended that 10-minute news conference, the pound sinking once again, reporters asking Truss if she'd apologise. Aren't you going to say sorry? 
All right, James Longman, thank you for that. And now to historic inflation numbers continuing to climb. Prices for everything from food to medical care costing Americans more. But some good news for seniors whose Social Security payments will be going up. ABC's Alexis Christophorus with more. From the grocery store to the doctor's office, stubbornly high inflation chipping away at American household budgets. Consumer prices jumping 8.2% in the past year, far outstripping wages, which are up just 5%. The typical American household now spending $445 more each month to cover the basics like rent and food. Higher prices being felt across the board. Food up 13% and medical costs rising 6 Six and a half percent. Falling gas prices were a bright spot last month, but they're back on the rise after oil producing nations agreed to cut oil production. And as we head into winter, the government warning it will cost at least 28 percent more to heat our homes. The Federal Reserve's string of interest rate hikes to try and cool inflation has left many priced out of the housing market as mortgage rates hit a 20 year high. One piece of good news Social Security recipients getting their big Biggest cost of living increase in 40 years, boosting their monthly payments by $146. But some seniors say that's still not enough. We need more help, more money for our medications, for our food, for our rent. President Biden acknowledging Americans are struggling with higher prices, but using the report to make a pitch for Democrats ahead of the midterm elections. Republican wins, inflation is going to get worse. It's that simple. Despite the hot inflation report, stocks staged a stunning rebound Thursday. The Dow rising 800 points as investors scoop up beaten down stocks and bet that high inflation will soon peak. Our thanks to Alexis Christophorus for that. Next, to the midair scare on a flight from Chicago to Miami. A bird strike just after takeoff forced the plane to turn around. So what did the passengers hear and see out of their windows? ABC's transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, with the details. The United flight had just taken off from Chicago, bound for Miami, when the airline says the jet experienced a bird strike. This image showing flames shooting from the engine shared by airdrop among passengers. Something just didn't feel right about the takeoff. You think the worst possible scenario that you're going to, you're not going to survive it. We do see smoke uh, and fire coming out of the left. Roger. The pilot declaring an emergency, turning the Boeing 737 around back to O'Hare. No one on board the flight was injured, and those passengers were put on another plane to Miami. This is not a heart-stopping emergency, but it is an emergency. Anytime we have something going wrong with an engine and a bird flying through it uh, is certainly in that category. Bird strikes are very common, about 16,000 a year, but they rarely cause any serious accidents. All right, Gio, thank you. Still to come tonight, more than a dozen workers dead after a mine accident. The desperate search for the dozen still trapped underground. And we speak with comedian Eliza Schlesinger about her new tour, her new book, and what she says is her ultimate wish. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. We are tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. There was a deadly coal mine accident in Turkey. At least 22 workers were killed in an explosion believed to have been caused by a methane leak. 17 others were injured, many of them in intensive care tonight. And about 50 miners are still trapped underground. Rescue teams are scrambling to that area to aid in the search. A rare political protest in Beijing. Authorities today tore down banners calling for President Xi Jinping's removal and an end to strict COVID-19 policies, but not before the pictures hit Chinese social media sites, sending the country's internet censors scrambling to snuff out all mentions of the incident. This just days before the start of China's twice a decade Communist Party Congress, in which President Xi is expected to break with recent tradition and stay in power for a third term. And the UN World Food Program says Haiti is facing a catastrophic hunger crisis. The agency's most uh, severe level for the first time ever. An unrelenting series of crises, including gang violence, inflation, and a cholera outbreak, have crippled that country. The agency reports that nearly 5 million people, that's almost half the population, are facing hunger. They add that 100,000 children under five are suffering from severe malnourishment. With the release of her sixth Netflix special and her book, All Things Aside, Absolutely Correct Opinions, in the same week, it's safe to say that comedian Eliza Schlesinger is busy, unapologetically frank and honest. Her comedy draws in audiences for its relatability from discussing ugly bras to women's empowerment tonight. We take a look at her career and latest milestones, but first, we had to ask her about her recent appearance on Celebrity Jeopardy. Here's ABC's Will Reeve. So you were recently on Celebrity Jeopardy. Yeah. How'd that go? You tell me. <laughs> okay, uh, all things aside, because it's my book for 200. How amazing is that? It's amazing and nerve wracking. In fact, one of your producers came in and she was like, you seemed anxious. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, thank you so much for that note. Yeah, uh, right, awesome. I was because the truth is like, I love competition. I love game shows. I love gameplay. I get super fired up. Very nice. Whatever. Very nice. Yeah. Your sixth Netflix special mm -hmm. out now. Your book is out. You're on tour doing comedy and talking about your book. What is the experience like for you right now in your life? To have my book, All Things Aside, and Hot Forever come out on the same day. It's like having two children. You're like, how do I show you both love equally? Um, both of these have been a long time coming, so I'm incredibly proud. The way that you do your stand-up is hilarious. You're laughing out loud, but you're also thinking. What sort of maybe responsibility or purpose do you feel speaking about such serious issues in your funny comedy? I'm an intentional person and I like picking things apart and analyzing them. I love knowing why we are the way that we are. It comes out in my writing and it's just the lens with which I use, to, it's how I look at things. And in terms of wanting to make people feel better, wanting to make women feel better, I think we have to dissect what we go through and how we are received. Baby. He's like, you know, we have a real baby. I'm like, but this one has four feet. <laughs> I believe that we all should be working together to make everybody feel better. This is what the purpose of being alive is. And I say the things in my special because women deserve to feel seen and they deserve to feel heard and they deserve to not be made to feel bad for things that are natural and normal. You say in your special, quote, we like the idea of empowering women. In theory, that's a really nice idea, but in practice, we're still very uncomfortable with the idea of a strong woman who makes money. Is it fair to call you a strong woman who makes money? Sure, I'll take it. Okay. I make so, some money. So as a strong woman who makes some money, I would like you to expand, expand and expound on that profound statement. After I wrote that, I was like, well, women in rap are very good about like showing that. And so maybe you take a page from that book, but it's always when women make money, women are the first ones called to tasks for their misgivings or their grievances. I think women have to answer for more things because we are seen as caregivers and maternal. And I think we analyze women under a harsher lens than we do men. There's 
a stigma around miscarriages mm -hmm. and about pregnancy generally, but specifically miscarriages, specifically for you, you had a miscarriage. I did. And you're did. quite open about it. Yes. That's clearly a personal choice that has an expected outcome for you, I would imagine. And I wonder what is the expected outcome of being so vulnerable about something so personal? I just don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. And I think that's another thing that we are brainwashed into thinking is your fault or makes you weird or you should be embarrassed about. On my own, when it happened, I remember thinking I don't feel ashamed to inform anyone in my close circle that this happened. Because the idea that anybody would give me anything other than love and support, like who's gonna be like, well, what did you do? And I wanted to, impart that on other women and let them know that by normalizing this conversation, it's not that it's gonna take the sting out of it, but at least you don't have to bear the burden of thinking your, your health is an outlier or you're wrong or you did something. At least you can, you can set that down. When people who buy this book get it into their hands, yep. to you, what's the ideal experience for them to have? I want people to laugh first and foremost. I want. I want them to have fun. I wrote the book that I wanted to read. I was having trouble finding myself in books, and I thought, well, I could do this. Have you always been so astute in observing the world around you and being able to articulate what you're seeing? I think the being observant was always there. That quality was always there, because I think that's what makes a funny person. Oh, you've got big boobs. Is that hard? I think funny people are smart um, and uh, observant, but I don't know that I had always the ability to tie the two together. It's not so much not intelligently, but you know, your world is limited when you're younger and you start to build out from that. And it brings you some peace to analyze the world and be like, well, we've seen this before. That's why- You're not alone. You're not alone. If, if people, more people knew that they weren't alone, I almost said, then they won't feel so lonely. <laughs> it's true, though. It would be a happier society. Our thanks to Will and Eliza for that conversation. And still to come, all of the thrills with none of the danger, from roller coasters to horror movies, why so many people enjoy a good scare. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, and now with the historic midterms inching closer, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Ready for election night, I'm ready for debate night, I'm ready for it all. This midterms is really important. Hi everyone. We're gonna run you ragged. What would George do? We're working on it, George, we're gonna make you proud. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. From roller coasters to horror movies, safe fear is a thrill that entices many seekers. But unlike too many spins on your favorite ride, getting a good scare can actually be good for you. ABC's Rhiannon Alley has a closer look at the science of being scared. For the past 44 years, Halloween has belonged to Michael Myers. I killed him. You can't kill the boogeyman. And this year is no different. 12 films and four decades later, he's back for Halloween Ends. Tonight, I will kill him. Come and get me. He had 
two of the greatest icons of horror movie fame, Jamie Lee Curtis and Mike Myers, the, the mask. And it just persists. And you're also got an entire generation that grew up with this. Aside from these fan favorites, the original Scream Queen and the bad guy we love to hate, there's science behind scary movies too. Horror is good for you because it releases adrenaline, it releases anxiety. It's a group um, activity that is very unique to horror. You know, talk to the screen and you get to say, don't go in there, and the person goes in there. And In fact, some of the first talkies on the big screen were scary movies, Dracula and Frankenstein among them. One theory as to why we love horror when we see Michael Myers chasing someone down the street we activate psychological detachment by reminding ourselves that they are just actors and great acting is what is happening on the screen. And the more popular but slightly more unnerving idea is known as the beast within theory. Malcolm Turvey, director of film studies at Tufts, says deep down part of us enjoys seeing the murder and mayhem the monster unleashes because if we could, we would do that. Could we have more in common with Mike Myers than we're comfortable admitting? It's that time of year again. All right, Rhiannon and Allie, thank you for that. And that's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news.